Good morning, everyone. Afternoon and evening from whatever part of the world you guys are joining. Um, welcome to the GBSN Cross Border Coffee Break, uh, titled Teaching Responsible Leadership and Sustainable Development at IMT Dubai. Um, so my name is Nicole Zephyrin. I'm the Communications Officer at the Global Business School Network. Um, today we're joined by a multi-stakeholder uh, perspective panel. So we've got Dr. Gita um, from IMT Dubai, who will share the faculty perspective. We've got two MBA students joining from India at IMT Ghazibad doing their dual degree program with IMT Dubai. Um, Samprika, Samprika, and forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, um, Adihatyan. <laughs> and then we have um, Mr. Ken Aim, the CEO of the SOHO Foundation, who will provide the nonprofit perspective. And then finally, Mr. Gaurav Koshua, who is the business head of Godbridge Kenya, who will provide the corporate perspective. Um, they're also the project sponsors. Before I go over the, um, the, about the Global Business School Network, I just wanted to show you how to submit a question throughout the webinar. So throughout the entire webinar, you can submit a question in the Q&A function without disrupting the presentation of the speakers. Now to do that, you'll see at the bottom black toolbar, the Q&A button, see here in the, circled in red, you click that, this box right here on the right will pop up. This is where you can input your question. You can send it anonymously if you'd like to, and you can check that if you'd like to, or send it with your name, and then click, click send. This will put your question in a queue that will be answered at the end of the webinar um, during our Q&A portion. Any questions that won't be answered live will be provided via Word document Q&A report following the webinar. So briefly about GBSN, um, the Global Business School Network, we are a network of 75 business schools in 40 countries. Um, we, our mission is to improve access to quality management education for the developing world, and we do this through catalyzing our network. Um, we administer and foster capacity building programs. We support activities that promote best practice amongst our member schools, and we foster network and partnerships. So collaboration, um, knowledge sharing, promotion of best practice, just like our webinar today. If you'd like more information about GBSN, you can visit our website down here, www.gbsn.org. I'll hand it over to Dr. Gita to begin the presentation. Thank you, Nicole. Um, just for everyone to know, I'm, I'm joining here from a mobile phone, so I, I will be visible and I, I would only be able to speak from here and I guess you can hear me. Uh, I'm, the presentation today is about uh, teaching responsible leadership and sustainable development at IMT Dubai and uh, the belief that we have uh, while we present this and while we talk to you about this, is that educationals can make a real difference to the world. And they can do that if the faculty and the students can take, take up impactful projects and if they are development projects to ensure, and they can ensure results. So that's one thing that we believe. And the other thing that we believe in is that uh, the B school can, can and should prepare conscientious managers uh, for the corporate world. And when we say that, we mean that these students should be motivated as well as equipped to take up and support such uh, development projects once they join the corporate world. So with those two things in our mind, uh, we're going to be sharing with you today uh, one of the projects that uh, we took up over here at IMT Dubai. And uh, uh, who you are meeting today are all stakeholders of that, different stakeholders of that project. Of course, there are many more people, but... Uh, we are representing different organizations. I come from IMT Dubai and I'm a faculty there. Uh, the flow of the webinar uh, today will be that first, uh, the student uh, Adityan Anavilingam, who's part of this project, is going to give an overview of the project that we did, the Light Up Kenya project, followed by Samprita, who's going to be sharing the key learnings from the project. Then uh, Ken is going to be sharing, Ken, who's the CEO of Sogo and with whom we have collaborated to del deliver the development project. He's going to share the NGO's perspective and that why B schools should collaborate with NGOs. Uh, then uh, Gaurav and Charles, who is also present, they will present the industry's perspective and why companies should collaborate with NGOs and B schools. Uh, 
also a perspective from the corporate point of view. And then I'll come in and share with you, you know, a little more detail on our learnings from this project and what we think that other B schools and other faculty members can and should do uh, and why they should, uh, you know, encourage uh, such projects, faculty as well as students to take up such projects. So basically, the Light of Kenya project that we have done, we're going to be sharing the details, our learning, and what we think can be taken away from this. So with that, uh, let me hand over to Aditian, who's going to share with you the, uh, the overview, an overview of the uh, Light of Kenya project. Over to you, Adi. Thank you, Dr. Lita. Hello, everyone. Before starting, we extend our sincere gratitude to GBSN for recognizing and appreciating our project, Light Up Kenya. We students of IMT Dubai got the opportunity to help the poor Kenyan communities when Mr. Ken Aim, CEO of SOA Foundation, informed us about their work in an awareness session arranged by Dr. Gita Bajaj. The visuals which you are seeing right now on screen are, the, are from, taken from the villages of Kohelo and Niyadi. As you can see, people over there lived in small shacks built out of mud walls and tin roofs. They lacked basic lighting, potable water, drainage, and even medical facilities. Upon discussion with Mr. Ken, we further understood that few children who could afford schooling had to study with the help of kerosene lamps at night. The suit of those lamps are harmful to human eyes. And as a result, most of the people, specifically children, were suffering from partial loss of vision. This was when our team decided to light up the villages with an affordable, scalable, and sustainable solution, which is nothing but solar bottle lamps. The solar bottle lamps are basically transparent two liter PET bottles filled with water that refract solar light when installed on the corrugated sheet roof rooftops of the buildings. A 1.5 watt solar panel and associated circuits can tap solar energy during daytime and discharge to light up an LED lamp during night hours. This is based on an open source design of the Light of Litter of Light program of PepsiCo and My Shelter Foundation's initiative in Philippines. As, an, as MBA students, we know that just an idea is not good enough. Hence, to deliver the project, we collaborated with SOVO, which is an NGO organization based in Western Kenya and was founded by Mama Sarah Obama. Over the years, SOHO has implemented many projects in the field of health, education, renewable energy, and environment for the betterment of Kenyan people. SOHO helped us in establishing a working relationship with the beneficiaries of those villages. On the other hand, Godridge Group appreciated and agreed to sponsor our project. They have given their consent to fund 1,800 solar bottles to light up 600 homes in the villages of Kohelo and Niyadi. This is followed by an intensive planning phase. To understand the nuances of implementing such a project on foreign land and to check the feasibility with the prototype, a team visited Kenya in July during the visit of former President Barack Obama. A pilot run has been planned in the month of January 2019 when the team will be installing solar bottles in 20 homes of the villages. During this stage, Detailed training will be imparted to 12 locals who would be the key players in full-scale implementation. Under close supervision of SOHO and the CSR team of Godridge, the rest of the homes will be lit up. This project would improve the living conditions of beneficiaries of this project. Not only 600 homes will be lit, but also permanent removal of hazard of eye infections, particularly in children, because of the suit from the kerosene lamps. As we have proposed to pay wages for the team working in the full-scale implementation, they shall earn and would also add value to their skill set. They will be adept in installing and fabricating the electronic circuitry by the end of pilot project, which is supposed to be happen in January. Most importantly, the team will become self-sufficient and further propagate their skill to others and make this project a sustainable one. While it will be beneficial for the Kenyan community, it was and will be a great learning opportunity for us too. Since management studies is all about learning from practice and few of the following slides, Samprakta has put across learnings derived from this project. So over to you, Samprakta. Hello everyone. Thank you, Adishan. 
when i look back the academic and the organization based projects that we have done till date had an objective learning outcome deliverables articulately defined before it began there were organization norms structures continuous reviews to ensure things happen the way they should while this project only had an objective that is to light up kenya rest everything was defined or is yet to be defined as we proceed to achieve that objective when we introspected our journey since last july we were able to discern our learnings from this process and identify how a non profit entrepreneurial project like ours is different from others first and foremost is the team building with dr geeta i had spent a lot of time working to understand how we will deliver the project we understood we needed a we needed a team a committed team it was clear that the managerial and the technical skills of the person came a lot later when compared to the dedication to do it or the wish to do it aditya and shrira who are my friends shared the common views and thoughts about this project that made me believe that these are my people and will best suit the team which ultimately proved true at various stages of this project we have invited and included people in our team who had the resources to help us however those collaborations have failed and now i can understand why because they did not share the same vision moving forward the proposal version 7a b c now proposal has those defined headings you know, which we fill for all our academic projects for imaginary audience however for this project the audience was for real i learned how to tweak each proposal like for sogo a non profit organization for iimt dubai which is the facilitating institute and for our sponsor gotrej moreover we also learned how a high level budget is to be made and making it instilled responsibility and accountability for the funds to be spent well next was raising funds for project which had to take into account the scale of the project interest of a corporate sustainability drive of the corporate and of course our reach and network we learned from dr geeta how one should network and identify influential individuals of a corporate who would like to fund our project following this we went for the pitch where i was supposed to present the proposal i could derive an understanding of what a corporate looks for when it delegates a csr project the feedback received from mr vaibhav head hr godrej after the pitch has guided us to understand that one should be aware of the ground realities while our knowledge till then was limited to what we have heard and read and searched on google he connected us with other people from godrej kenya followed by our visit to kenya where interacting with people gave us deep insights about the further planning this project was initially planned to be our internship and hence we had opted out of the internship process from our college in the last week of summer placement we had to resume searching for our internship opportunities when the approval certificate due from red crescent required for working with an ngo of other countries did not seem to come through the team realized then that how licenses approvals all law of the land could rule the timeline of a planned project if sidelined a project so spread across geography and time needs an aggregator i understand the role of dr geeta who had kept all the stakeholders on the same page after our first year's course in dubai we moved to india for completion of our course when the launch was proposed in kenya her persistent follow up of in checking with checking with every stakeholder about their problems throughout the tenure and during our visit made the launch successful unlike an organization based project where all stakeholders have profit earning interest project like ours are not profit earning and hence needs an aggregator or a project lead to keep the stakeholders involved and motivated throughout at every step i had people who motivated me to work and proceed to achieve the objective of this project 
and also people who reminded me that this project has no tangible benefits for me. You will have nothing to put on your CV, no stipend, you are spending on it as well. But fortunately enough, I did go. And I thank Dr. Geeta, Sridam, Adityan, and my parents who rightly drove me to think positively about this endeavor. A truly global audience is today in interested and has acknowledged our work on the GVSN platform is a lot more than all those tangible benefits. During visit of former President Barack Obama, Soho gave us the opportunity to launch the project is an achievement in itself. When the community was so thankful that we took up to light of their lives, that's where we realized our importance as responsible human beings. All of these should be measured on a different scale is what we say. Over and above, we met influential people from Godrej, of course, Uber, Frey Kenya, Ms. Finali Galia, who has recently been crowned as Ms. World Kenya. They had visited there for launch of their respective projects. They congratulated and appreciated our project. Interaction with them helped us learn on what scale they are operating and what challenges they are facing. Those insights will definitely help us to plan better. We often tend to write comprehending ambiguous situations, adopting working culture of a new place, working with uh, limited resources, uh, going beyond our defined roles in our series. But that day, while we were making the prototype for the launch, we practically proved doing all of that. Now, it's definitely an addition to our skill set. As an operations major student, I took up strategic procurement as a subject. Though small scale, but the practical implication of the same got illustrated during this project. When I did this in my previous workplace, when we made the prototype in Dubai, and when we make it, made it in Kenya, each time the requirement was the same. However, to identify the quality, price, availability, suitability to the situation and the associated logistics, was different for different places and was a learning through practice. And definitely this is not the end. Next year, when we would execute the pilot project and full-scale implementation, it would give us deeper insights into planning, scalability challenges, team building, training the team, resource mobilization and likes. With this, I would like to summarize that this exercise has reinforced some management lessons for us. However, it has and would give us new insights to undertake our future ventures and projects. When we started off with this project, the list of benefits did not exist for us. Recording them today is to just encourage students and, such, and institutes to take up such projects further so that they know the proof of pudding is in eating. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Ken, CEO Sobo, to air his views on the perspective of NGOs in collaborating with student projects. Thank you, Samprekta. And uh, thank, thank you everyone for sparing some time to sit with us and be able to share our experiences. One of the best things that happens with the NGOs is that we are first hand in contact with the community. And uh, being first hand in contact with the community, we are able to identify and relate to their problems first hand. This gives us an edge on how we can be able to try and find solutions for them in the challenges that they go through in everyday life. And in terms of uh, finding those solutions, we find collaborations with different, different players. Some of the players being like the students, uh, like what we've done with IMG Dubai, and also the collaboration that we are now having with Goodrich Kenya in terms of uh, uh, financing the project that we are facing right now. So collaborations in, uh, with the business schools has given so a partner with whom we can share our challenges and we're able to tackle these challenges in the best way possible. Because the, uh, the business schools have the network in terms of the students and the faculty. These are two arms of uh, a school that really bring in different, different kind of, uh, uh, you know, advantages uh, towards challenging, uh, towards facing the, uh, handling the challenges that are, that are being faced in the community. Like for example, the, 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 the 
faculty can be able to help in terms of uh, uh, research work and all these kind of things. And since there are a myriad of uh, challenges that are uh, facing the community, we are able to share in with them. And uh, apart from just uh, the research, we are able to get consultancy at a fee that is affordable because sometimes when you're doing or handling these kind of uh, challenges, you'll need consultants who at times are not very affordable in terms of you know, their, their professional fees and everything that is required. So in terms of what I get when it comes to the knowledge transfer, this one was who are trained in different areas, which not necessarily are in business related fields. But with this kind of collaboration, they are able to get expansion into their knowledge and we are able to do um, things uh, in a more professional way because they tend to get the exposure and all this kind of thing. Uh, so in this uh, kind of uh, in, uh, collaboration, we'll also gain in terms of you know, getting access to vital seminars and workshops. All these are gained towards capacity building and this will uh, help us deliver more, better solutions to the challenges that are, that are faced with the, with the community in every day. So also, like for example, in the light up, uh, I'll also talk about uh, the projects, how they help the community. Uh, in terms of, let's say, for example, they, they normally have a ripple effect kind of um, uh, uh, end product. Because like now we did Light Up Kenya. Light Up Kenya product uh, was basically aimed at lighting, giving cheap solutions to the community in terms of uh, lighting the, 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 their housing. But it ends up but gaining... Like Sorry? Hello? It also ends up giving them solutions in terms of um, uh, health. We found that there are less eye infections, there are less health infections in terms of chest congestions and stuff like that. So we, the families and the, the, the supporting NGO as so, we end up spending less in terms of health and uh, stuff like that. This also translates to some more money into the pockets of the parents. For example, what, if they would have bought kerosene for 20 Kenyan shillings, which is uh, slightly less than uh, some, some cents in dollars, this money can go into buying food, can go into buying uh, you know, books and any other things that uh, they might need in terms of uh, the daily usage at home. So this kind of uh, also gives them more comfort in their, in their home. So for each challenge that is tackled professionally and uh, with the support of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the sponsors, we, there's always so much more that is gained more than meets the eye. Some uh, of the benefits come in without even us realizing that this is, this is going to come. So in terms of the learning institutions that are in, within the community, they normally gain in terms of student exchange program. Like for example, if today the IMT Dubai has this uh, program with us and we, uh, we normally collaborate with the local training institutions, to be easy for the students from IMT Dubai to train some of the students in the local institution uh, for, for the general growth of it. And the students from the local institution will also develop a relationship with uh, IMT Dubai, and there we can be able to develop a student exchange program, which will give the students an advantage in terms of learning and all that kind of stuff. The community, uh, uh, the, uh, those students will come back from the institutions that they are learning with more solutions to some of other problems that they have within their, within the community, because some of the problems are not really known with the outsiders, but the students who are 
in the community. So other things that, uh, another thing, other things that the, uh, the uh, global business school networks can do is also to assist us as NGOs and uh, the people working with the community in connection and uh, you know partnerships so that they can be able to connect with the corporates and all these other, inst other institutions that work closely with the school network and we're able to grow in terms of uh, capacity to change to challenge to face the challenges that are there and also the corporates that we partner with will give us uh, will have first-hand knowledge through interaction and help the, com uh, the community through their projects. The corporates also relate with the communities, not just in terms of the project projects, but also in terms of the products that they produce. Some of the products that they produce are consumed directly by the, by the community. And this will also create a bridge between the two institutions, the community and the, and the corporates. So lastly, I think this will lead to good fa funding for most of the projects that need to be carried out because the corporates are who are the sponsors and the students who would like to implement or explore their, 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 their innovations will have a good platform to carry this out. So I believe that so would be in a good position to be able to give out this kind of platform to both parties and also to the Global Business School Network. So I'll hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Charles, who's here with me, and Mr. Gorav to talk a little bit about the cooperative perspective. So before we jump into uh, the corporate perspective, I think it's important to give you guys an oversight on the Godrej group per se. So Godrej is a 120 year young organization, multi-local organization with origins in India, but uh, presence now across Africa, Latin America, Indonesia, and US, uh, along with India, of course. Right? One of the key cores for Godrej as an organization is the cause of social responsibility and being looked at as a responsible corporate. Hence, the CSR philosophy is well embedded in our operations as well. Uh, the way we look at it, uh, there are three broad buckets where we feel we can make an impact. It is one, trying to create a more employable workforce. B, how do you make the environment more green? And third is innovation. And these are the three facets we keep investing. They are not, it is not limited to the three, but these are the ones we typically uh, look at investing in. I think as we go into the next few slides, you will see some of the examples of uh, the work we are doing in Kenya. For example, in Kenya, we have 11 vocational centers where more than 2,000 youth have been trained. This is in the domain of creating employability, as I said earlier. In the next slide, we are trying to uh, manage a greener environment. So we, we pick up waste and what we are now trying to do is upcycle the same to produce construction material. The next slide. And of course, the project, which is, which is what we are discussing here, which goes in the domain of providing uh, uh, solar lamps, right? And which is again in the domain of being good to the, to the society is something which uh, is what we've embarked on with Sovo and uh, uh, IMG Ghaziabad. I think I'll ask Charles to take us through, Charles is our CSR lead. He'll take us through, the, through the, our perspective on why we should partner here. <clears throat> Thank you, Gaurav. Good evening, everyone. And, um... As a corporate, I think um, these kind of partnerships, especially with uh, uh, business schools, um, we... Uh, Nicole, I think you... Yeah, this is the one. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So the kind of partnerships that we look at, um, especially with the business schools and uh, in working with the, uh, NGOs, um, we feel would help us, one, get a workforce that is well-skilled, and has the required capacity to help us drive the business agenda, which is our core business, so to speak. Again, um, through such partnerships, we are sure of uh, innovation, you know, uh, funding innovation projects, which again would help us get sustainable business solutions. 
Uh, all this is geared towards providing, you know, solutions to social political challenges that various uh, communities with whom we do business experience in different parts of the world. Um, moving to the next slide, um, our work again with the, these schools um, is to ensure that uh, we, they contribute, the partnerships contribute towards reducing our carbon footprint in the entire business portfolio. We are talking about production in our factories. How do we work with these schools to innovate and ensure that we have reduced carbon emissions? Uh, we are at, uh, you know, um, taking more of uh, renewable sources of energy in our production process. This can only be realized and achieved if we work closely with the business schools. If we work with communities, um, you know, to plant more trees within our factories and within the uh, local um, um, uh, geographies, so as to do what we call the carbon offset. Yeah, you know, for every tree that you plant, you know, we are setting a certain level of carbon um, footprint. And again, we are talking about um, less use of uh, hydro uh, generated sources of uh, power in our production. Um, again, through working with um, the NGOs, for example, we are able to identify need youth in different communities, empower them, because again, we are not jacks of all trade as corporates, and therefore we depend on strategic partners to help us drive certain agenda. So in working with NGOs, we are able to identify needy um, youth and members of uh, you know, societies, uh, give them required skills, which will in turn empower them and make them employable. Um, uh, so for example, uh, we'll be working in a project that will be targeting vulnerable uh, women uh, in, in a certain geography and skilling them and again placing them in job opportunities. Uh, moving again, um, there is the aspect of um, having all these leading to improved livelihoods. I mean, a youth who can earn a living from uh, a skill that they have acquired are able to improve their livelihoods. And ultimately, as a corporate, with all these, we are sure we're providing uh, sustainable solutions in the entire business ecosystem. And therefore, uh, such strategic partnerships make more sense to us. And I want to appreciate our partners in this sense, the IMTP and so on, for being part of the uh, journey that you're currently working. Thank you. Um, over to you, Dr. Gita. Thank you, Charles. Um, so with uh, Charles giving that perspective, we kind of uh, have gone over uh, experiences and thoughts of all the stakeholders uh, who are coming together to work for our core stakeholders, which are the people in Niadi in Gogeno, uh, who we think that deserve much more than what they have in their lives. And all the time in our classrooms and other corporate boardrooms and everywhere, we have conversations about there has to be more equity in this world and there is need for us all to contribute towards making that happen. I think Light Up Kenya project is a, is a very, very tiny step that we as a business school have to do to contribute and come true to what we talk in our classes. So uh, really speaking, um, when we do this project, on one hand, we, uh, we think that it's a great thing to do because we are able to make a small difference to the world. On the other hand, I think we are just doing our duty because uh, as a business school, perhaps it is a, it is a foremost responsibility that we have to be develop uh, leaders of tomorrow who are responsible leaders and who understand their role in making this world a more a uh, sustainable world where we are, we very care for, um, we very care for the rest of the world, right? And the objective, while the objective of profit is always there, but the objectives of sustainable development and are are larger than that is what we think uh, should be driven home. So, uh, as you see on the slide, there are so many of the stakeholders who came together to develop this project and. Uh, and it just came through the conversations also, which happened, the, the, the speeches that happened before me. Every one of them has played such a critical role in making that happen. 
uh, thanks to Soho, the way uh, it has been working all these years on the ground to have a connect with the people uh, on the ground. And, you know, today, if we say something needs to be done, Soho can just go there and make sure that those groups come together and they listen to what we are talking about and they're really able to deliver the project. On the other hand, we can reach out over there only if, you know, we have the resources to do that. And, and if Godridge is not there, uh, it's too difficult to go out and deliver that. And deliver what? So something that, that you know, we need to think about is to how we can make things different. Uh, what is the solution that can be brought about? How can that be implemented? And I'm, I'm so delighted that we do have students who believe in all of this and that we are able to inspire them to take up such projects and put together. So, so many of these people are coming together to make that happen. One could ask, what is the role of a faculty in that? What do business schools have to do? Because uh, NGOs and corporates can come together and get consultants to do the work and it can be delivered. So where do these schools and where do students come in? Um, and so here's where we think that they come in we need to develop leaders of tomorrow. So as these schools, if we take that up as a responsibility as responsible leaders, then doing such projects make a big sense for us. Uh, it's pretty different from doing uh, another project which is which they would otherwise do in the corporate. So let me uh, just share with you some insights that I think can be of interest to faculty members and B-schools who I understand, uh, you know, on this webinar, and otherwise also for Global Business School Network, uh, would be, um, uh, would be, would find a little interesting to know of this project. So I think that it's important that um, schools take up such projects, but it's very important, one of the learnings is it's very important that when they pick up the project, they select the project with great caution. Uh, what we see a lot of times in uh, schools and colleges is that when they inspire the students to pick up projects, students would be doing anything. Like for example, uh, they would pick up a project of going and teaching you know, the, in a school which, is, uh, which, which requires help. Well, there's nothing wrong in doing that, but there is no management training that gets done. But if you ask those same students to pick up a project where they can create a school and an ecosystem which continues to deliver the education for a long time, then that's a worthy project, right? So one of the insights that I think is important for a B-school faculty to have is to understand which projects to pick up. For us in our case, for example, in the Light of Kenya project, finding the solution of a very, a very uh, sustainable solution was only one part of it but thinking as to how do we deliver. So if the students go there and install these lights in all the 1800 homes, it's a different project from the students going there, training 20 people, those 20 people, then further training people, and then they, they take it as their livelihood is a generation because then they go and charge people and then they put it up for the others and then they can take this project to other villages. So we have trained more people to take up this and then spread this, not just in two villages, but I'm told that there are much larger number of villages that need this kind of a solution. So these people who are there in Kenya itself can do this on their own. And so we have a livelihood generation that happens. So that's a good management project. So as a B-School faculty, it's very important to, to understand what kind of projects uh, should we pick up when we are talking to students and trying to make them understand about uh, philanthropic action. The second thing, um, as B-School faculty, uh, we have a role to play is to sensitize the students to the needs of sustainability and community development. Now, why do I say that? I say that because um, I'm all the time there and the glitter of the corporate world um, can uh, really blind just anybody. So when uh, some of the students would get projects which are in very big multinational corporations and they will get very handsome stipends. And then along with those stipends, they would have a very regulated, uh, already well-oiled machinery within which a project has already been designed and they go and just do that and come out. So it's so much uh, more organized and easy for them to go and do that and also get bigger returns. Whereas in this case, when they have to come here, 
to look at it from a distance is highly unglamorous. You're going in a village, you're going to be staying in a smaller hotel, what are you going to do? You'll not have a big name to reflect on your CV, etc., etc. So it's the responsibility of the faculty to make the students see that how this is so much more superior in terms of learning because you really go on the ground and you have to deliver on all the terms. So it's like a, like we call a capstone. So everything comes into play when you go there and, and make that happen, right? Um, the third thing uh, which is important is to make all of this happen. The faculty would have to demonstrate entrepreneurship and encourage their students also to do so. So like some Priksar, sometime back, she, how, you know, she was so, uh, so she and the, and the other students as well, you know, would go into a space of doubt as to whether they stand the road and how they are committed, how to get reports. So starting from there, like you have not. And you start from there on, here's the problem, here's the solution. Here is getting the resources. So everything you bring yourself on the table, and then you make it happen. So it's a full uh, entrepreneurial venture that you do for the students to be doing it. It's important that the faculty will demonstrate that and stand there to make it happen. That I think the first thing I think is is very important for such projects to happen. The fourth is that uh, you know uh, when you go to the corporate. All to the angels. When you see our students who do this job, um, there is a limited amount of confidence they can have on the students to deliver everything in the chemistry unless school and the faculty stand there in commitment and say, okay, please go ahead and, and trust them. We are there to make sure that it's going to happen. So if Godrej is going to, for instance, and Godrej, any corporate is going to give. Uh, $40,000, $50,000, $100,000 in a project. They want some commitment. So just giving it to some students for a student project, they would need some confidence that they can get from somewhere. And I think these schools and faculty should take a stand there if they can take that, you know, provide that confidence. I'm sure a lot of uh, NGOs and corporates would be happy to support this endeavor of uh, sustainable development as well as development of students who finally would be their employees one day, right? Um, the next thing I, I think uh, is relevant and important with respect to this uh, project is that uh, while one off project is one thing, but I think these schools and on a large scale have to create systems and processes to promote such work. And, and why, when, we, when I say that, it would start from sensitizing the professors. We've been talking about sensitizing the, the students, but I think even before that, uh, there have to be activities to sensitize professors for the need of that. Because just as I'm saying, we see there is a lot of glitter in the corporate world, and when you're offering consultancy, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the glitter can be for anybody, uh, very much so for those who can even charge for that kind of consultancy. So for them, for professors to be uh, sensitized to the need of spending their time on things which, uh, which are more intangible, which give intangible returns for themselves. But you know, if you look at a bigger perspective, it's a far bigger goal that they achieve. So uh, that, and then um, so once they are sensitized, their role in terms of developing relationships with NGOs, with corporate. Uh, streamlining the process of student recruitment into these, and then if they can, you know, put into the curriculum, allow the students to earn some credits and the faculty to get some credit for the kind of work. I think that would do a lot of support to the creation of an ecosystem which uh, allows such development projects to be taken up by students and faculty. And I think last uh, but not the least, all of this can get a big support if accreditation bodies also recognize such works. So if they recognize this kind of work, this important uh, work that these schools are doing, I think it can make a big difference here. This is where, for instance, when organizations like Global Business News Network, they come and provide platforms and talk to uh, different faculties and deans and, and talk about promoting such uh, efforts. Uh, I think they make a big difference. So thank you, Nicole, for for looking out and reaching out to us and asking us to share and appreciating the work that happened here. 
So um, over to you, Nicole, for taking up any questions that the, uh, that may be there for us. Yes, okay, great. So we've got a few questions here. Uh, okay, one, for the students, uh, did this count toward degree requirements or was it an extracurricular activity? So it was not into our credits, but I do not consider it to be an extracurricular activity because I have learned a lot from it. An extracurricular activity would be something that is for entertainment or a separate uh, facet of our uh, education. However, this has aided us like a project, like any internship project that we do. So I do not consider it to be an extracurricular activity. However, it didn't have any credits. Okay. Um, oh, how did the how did you connect with the corporate? Was it through an existing relationship with the SOWO Foundation? So I guess that's for Gita or for Garav or for Ken. I can I can take that up. So uh, no, so there wasn't an existing relationship between the NGO and Goodrich, but I happened to be in touch with uh, the. Um, the head, uh, the, the CEO of Godrej here in Dubai, who was the head of the entire uh, uh, Middle East and Africa. And we happened to have a conversation, which is where I was sharing with him about the project, the project that we're doing. And he shared with me that they have interest in Kenya and they already have so much of work that they're doing. And why don't he said that, why don't you share with us the details of the project that you're doing? And that's how we got started so then we went and presented to them the work that we were already uh, you know we were already a certain stage with uh, Sobo we were planning all of that uh, and we were still looking for a sponsor so we had our solution we had our prototype by then uh, we were already working with Sobo to identify people who are going to be uh, delivering the project all that was happening and at the same time then we, uh, I was in touch with this uh, with uh, with the CEO, Mr. Naveen, uh, here in uh, in Dubai, and then he put us through to uh, Mr. Gaurav in uh, in Kenya, and so then when I visited Kenya, me and Ken went and met Mr. Gaurav, who again was able to appreciate the potential in this particular project, and then uh, he sent Charles over to to with Ken to see really the work being done by Sovo at the grassroots, and that's how it worked. I would just add there, I also happen to be the alumni of the same college. So that was another mm. link. <laughs> that's very important. Yeah. And, and that's a feather to the cap, right? So we, yeah, we have a responsible leadership it's coming from the institute. Yeah. Okay, great. But what uh, if uh, I would say that the one that's Gaurav, I would say you still did the whole uh, due diligence by sending Charles to check everything, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> which, is, which is absolutely fair and, and okay. Great. Okay, so I think this is for Gita and Ken. Um, what tips would you give a nonprofit or a business school to connect with one another? So how, I guess, how did you guys establish a relationship? <laughs> so, Ken, would you answer or I take it? Ken, can you can start. You can you can start off, and then I'll finish. <laughs> okay. So, uh, actually, there was a conference here uh, happening in in Dubai, and uh, I happened to be one of the panelists, and on, on, uh, I'd been invited over there to speak. And Charles also was there in that conference to do a, a, an MOU signing with one of the corporates over here. And during the break of the conference, we got talking. And Ken started to share with me, you know, the kind of work that they are doing in Kenya. And I shared with him some of the things that I had been involved in back in India. And, uh, you know, how the things happen there and some of the things that can be done in Kenya. So we got talking about what all can be done in Kenya. I had absolutely no intention of, uh, you know, taking, uh, doing anything much there. But I think I must admit 
uh, Ken uh, kept sharing all the work that Soho was doing over there. And it, it set me thinking that, you know, all the time I had been thinking that I need to go back from Dubai to India because I wanted to do this kind of work in India. And that set me thinking, why India? I mean, if I'm getting a calling from Kenya, then so be it. <laughs> so be it. And so I need to respond to somebody who is calling rather than sitting here and waiting somebody. Someday I'll go back to India and I'll resume my work there. And that's how I got connected with Ken. And then it was really heartening to see the kind of work so was doing. And Ken then, we invited Ken over to IMT and then Ken came and shared yeah, so can you want to add on something? One of the things that was discussed in the conference that we were, we, where we met with Dr. Gita was on the sustainable development. And we were looking at some of the sustainable development and how they can be achieved and how they can be put in place in terms of the communities and all that kind of stuff. So that was one interesting area that we, had, we were sharing in common. Plus, uh, I kept sharing with her on the issues and the challenges that are faced by the community. So you'll find that mostly the, the advantage that the uh, NGOs have or the people who work right at the community have is that they understand the problems firsthand. And because I understood the problems firsthand and she had some solutions firsthand that I didn't know of, the collaboration paid off. Mm -hmm. So I think the collaboration between, uh, and then now the corporate was roped in and it has worked well. So I think it is really, really a big duty for the, for the NGOs who are working on the, on the ground to collaborate with uh, the faculty members and all, all the other stakeholders on the corporate in order for them to be able to give first-hand information to the people. So we kept exchanging, we kept uh, exchanging the, the challenges that are there. There are others which we discussed, but we settled on the light of Kenya as the first project that we had taken. And uh, there are other projects that we've also discussed that we'll bring into light later. But I think uh, that was the most uh, interesting bit of it all, that we were able to sit down and share and deliberate because after I had shared with her, she called in Saprita. She told me, Hey, look here, there's a student of mine here who's been thinking of doing something. We shared with Saprita, and the whole network fell in place. So I think uh, the issue of sharing the community, communal challenges between the NGOs and the faculties and the corporates is very key. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I have. I a think one of the things that. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Carry on, Nicole. Okay. I have a few questions that are kind of tied together. Uh, so here, how did okay. you select the two villages for the pilot? Were they more ready for your project than other villages? Is there a recommended approach for selecting villages for such a project? And then adding on to that, as part of sustainability, how do you provide an after service for the homes? Is there expertise, near, expertise nearby that can provide any repairs or replacements, replacements? How long do these solar powered lamps last? Uh, the way we selected the villages is because we are working with the villages first hand. And uh, these villages, uh, because the, the, all the other villages are, 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 we have several other villages that are facing the same challenge. We are working in over 300 villages, but we settled on this one uh, because of uh, it was a it, 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 it easy access compared to other villages, and we wanted to have the pilot project in a place where there's easy access, and then we take more challenging uh, villages as we grow the, uh, the project. So that that was uh, what informed that decision. Uh, I would like to add here, Nicole. I want to uh, say something here. Sorry. Yeah, Samprita, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so what I'm saying is, uh, for these solar lamps, we basically need corrugated sheet roofing. So we learned from Ken that not all the villages are ready for that. So they ha also have another project running alongside, which is for uh, sheet roofing of those uh, houses in those villages. So uh, since these two villages had houses with sheet roofing already, we chose these two villages. And it's not the end. Uh, our pilot project is planned for these two villages. However, the project would take up 
600 homes of different other different villages also and uh, secondly uh, yeah ma'am please continue no no complete complete sir you finish yeah so uh, about the after service for the homes this is why we chose to train the people there so basically i have done this project before and i know about the maintenance and thing firstly we have tried to make it as simple as possible so instead of making all those uh, circuitry and all we tried to take up uh, solar lamps that are readily uh, or the solar panels with the lamps readily available so that the number of parts reduces secondly the after service if required maybe about the battery replacements and things we will train those 12 people well so that they can uh, give all the after service required and uh, about the solar power lamps lasting if you talk about the bottle lamps they last for over 8 to 10 years however if you talk about the solar uh, panel and the circuitry associated it's about the battery that has to be replaced maybe in two or three years uh, apart from that the bottle is uh, rigid and robust enough to be lighting the homes for about eight years ma'am would you like to add something yeah in terms yeah. of so the main nice. sustainable the sustainability also with the uh, with the training of the locals we will have the, the the first batch of locals who are going to be trained first hand and then they also going to train other locals so we are going to have a replication of 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 the knowledge transfer in terms of uh, in terms of maintenance of uh, and manufacture and production of more of this uh, of this uh, uh, solar lamps and uh, stuff right Go ahead, Dr. Digita, you can add your... Uh, very little time left. Just one last thing. I think that whenever it comes to anything which, which is about understanding the implementation at the grassroots, we've always gone back to, to SOVO to help us decide. And I think we've gone into thinking about... Because when you select who you will be working with, it's very important to see that whether they have their you know, uh, they have their, um, their fingers on the pulse. So they, they really know what works and what doesn't. So for some of the things you need to. So for instance, if it were to talk to Godrej and do some decisions about it, um, Ken would turn around to me and ask me, okay, how do we go about it? And if I were to ask him about, hello, how do we go about things, uh, you know, which are to be done in the village, I would rather ask Ken and he would be able to answer this. So, we really, really depend on our partners to give us advice on, you know, how. And for instance, when we were talking about sourcing the materials, we really turned to Charles and said, Charles, hello, tell us, how do we get to, because it's a corporate which is doing bulk purchase, right, from so many sources. So they could come in and pitch in and say, hello, why don't we do it like this and become so much cheaper and more robust? So I think um, many of these decisions, we, we, we really need to see who's the expert and then ask them to. In our case, the village decisions came from Ken and, and from the technical parts, which, uh, which some Rick mentioned. Okay, great. I think there's, a, there's two more questions, but I think we're, we're almost out of time here. So I will provide those questions to all the panelists and they can answer it via Word document. All the materials, including the PowerPoint and the recorded webinar will be provided to you via email and the GBSN website, so don't worry if you miss certain parts of the webinar. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much to all of the panelists. We have them joining from India, from Kenya, and from Dubai. So this, you know, we've practiced, we've practiced the transitions. Everyone accommodated time on their schedule based on the time difference. Um, really a truly global project, multi-stakeholder perspective. <laughs> all of you got some good insight and maybe you know sprung some ideas on your end um if you have any questions i'd be happy to put you in contact with whoever so just let me know um also just as you you know a follow-up our next cross-border coffee break webinar will be on october 2nd at 10 a.m eastern looking at the designing the best tech mba for the fourth industrial revolution the speaker will be former Dean of Maastricht School of Management in the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Wim Nade.
So all of the information is, it is, is on the website under GBSN event calendars, also free to register. So if you're interested, be sure to join. Again, thank you to all of our panelists for participating today. And if, you know, keep in touch, this is, a, this is just the beginning of their project. So lots of stuff to come. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Great. Have a good day.